Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our webinar looking at on the man, on the man drone capability. Um, I'm Matt Williams. I'm the CEO of Brigantes, uh, and we're working with our partners here. And I can join by Steve, who's on the screen here, uh, from from Copters, uh, and we're working together to develop a and bring to you a a, a picture, a holistic picture of how drones. Uh, can be used and have a quick look at how they are currently being used within the within the defence environment. Um, I'll start off by introducing the panellists from today because I'm joined by quite a few people who bring some really interesting elements to the party. So first of all, I've, I've introduced Steve, uh, two members of his team join us, Sam, uh, Sam Deniff, who is the lead um, a business, business development guy from Copters looking within defence uh, he does a lot of work with the police, a lot of experience within that area, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, some of the platforms that we're talking about, uh, so, which is great. And then he's joined by Jim, uh, and Jim Pick is the director for, for survey and construction within Copters. Uh, and then this is one of the really interesting areas where some of these really simple and small tools uh, can actually be very, very powerful in helping us deliver an effect or, or achieve the objectives we wish to do. Then after that, we'll we'll speak with Graham Booth from 2IC. Uh, so uh, the CEO of uh, 2IC, they, they specialize in digital interoperability within the battle space. Uh, and now, although that's not directly drones, it's, it's a really, really important factor of how you integrate the products that drones give you and bring them into support your decision making, your command and control and everything like that. Interestingly enough, uh, Graham is also the elected chair um, of uh, of the of the SME forum at Tech UK, uh, which is the high tech trade body, and is a member of the MOD's SME working group. Uh, so uh, he is most definitely outclasses me as far as any technical uh, expertise uh, completely. Um, then we've got Phil Wright from Typhon, uh, and this is a really interesting part of the drone landscape and looking at payloads. And, and you know, we talk about payloads; they could be big. You know, I think you automatically start thinking about large drones carrying large elements. Well, what if they're really small? What can we bring to bring to the space to the to the end user there? Uh, unfortunately, uh, Sy Oliver from Forsberg can't join us. They've been hit hard by a, a, a bit of a COVID issue. Um, so I will be covering off the targeting uh, side of the discussion. Uh, and I do promise you, uh, um, I do have a little bit of a background with, within within that side. Uh, so I will do my best to do them justice, uh, but we wish them all well so that they will be fit and healthy soon. Um, and then you've got Rob Taylor. Uh, so Rob Taylor uh, and his business 4GD, really fascinating um, element where, where we're looking at the training environment from a synthetic point of view and, and how we can do that to build not just our planning cycles and everything, but also look at these these really key tools of drones and, and get better use out of them. And we'll talk about a little bit more about that. And then finally, to introduce the last member of the panel is uh, my manage, uh, my marketing director, sorry, not managing director, I have promoted him once already to say, um, and, and, and chief quiz master uh, is Justin Warmsley. So he'll be fielding any questions that, or bringing in the questions that you guys um, uh, ask us. And he will make sure that they're they're properly heard and, and make sure that I'm not missing anything um, anything important. Cool. Well then let's let's move on. Let me introduce um, on the man drone capability. So I think it's important to note that within the dro drone landscape we, we you know whether you've been in operations or not you've encountered drones in different ways particularly within the modern in modern operating environment and we're all very familiar with the, the larger drone elements there but what we want to focus in, on here are drone capabilities which are carried by the man um and 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 this is kind of our specialist area which is on the man equipment and therefore it's got to be able to integrate into what a person can carry and sustain themselves there's no point having a a 20 kilo drone because that precludes being able to carry all the other important operational pieces of equipment that you may or may, uh, or may need to take with you. Um, so looking at what the on-the-man drone definition is, you know, it's got to be lightweight, it's got to be small, it's got to be man-portable, um, and it doesn't require huge amounts of instructions to be able to get the data from it. It's got to be immediate, it's got to be ready there, and it's got to be functional. Uh, we want to move on, Justin, thanks. 
So when we looked at this problem uh, and trying to achieve this holistic approach to, to drones, what we were finding was that end users were very specifically looking at what can a drone deliver for me in the form of a camera. Um, and then also um, from the larger drones, they were very much, you know, there was there was a big gulf between, between them uh, and how they were interacting and how we were drawing the information forward. So what we decided to look at is, well, who wants to, who are the right people to using drones? What tasks can they use drones on the manned drones that is? Uh, to support and then start to look at the assets or the tools that, that are there. So straight away you can see, you know, whether it's special forces, um, just go back one, Justin, thank you, sorry, uh, special operations, uh, and, uh, and in brackets I've put the wrong reason, the powers because they themselves are going through an evolution within their, the way that they're operating at this moment in time. Infantry, who are equally evolving, but but it just brings it in a slightly different way. Artillery, engineers, and, and then command. And then on the on the task side of it, and this is where we'll structure the, the presentation today, you know, we'll start with where are we are at the moment. And actually it's recce really that we're, we're using these systems for in, 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 a, in the vast majority of cases. But then you're looking at command and control, you're looking at mapping, you're looking at survey, distraction, planning, uh, training, and, and, and finally kinetic side of stuff. And, and Phil will, will open, uh, shine a little bit of light on distraction and kinetic for you uh, when we get to that point. As far as tools are concerned, um, then actually what we're looking at here is, you know, to put it really into some physical elements, predominantly it's quadcopters that are being used at this moment in time with, uh, for the on the man space. And there you can see the Anafi range and then you can see the Sky Hero Loki 2, which is a GPS denied environment drone. Um, in addition to that, there is, there is a, a, quite a large opportunity with fixed wing. And, and that gives certain advantages over, the, over quadcopters and there are certain disadvantages. So it's applying the right tool for the right job at the right time. Then in addition to that and thinking about that integration, how do you make those drones you know, all fit in with all the equipment you've got? You've got to have the right controller. You don't want to be having three or four different drones to do lots of different jobs and then three or four different controllers to do a similar amount of different jobs. It's just inefficient uh, and it's extra load to carry for the person you know so that just takes us neatly into load carriage how do you support that drone when it's not not in the air how do you protect it how do you keep that capability live and and suitable so when you do need it it's then good to go and then finally looking beneath that is is payload what else can we bolt onto this drone as a platform to deliver an effect so those are the hardware elements from a making those tools deliver products whether that's mapping surveying imagery and a whole raft of different effects then the software and the integration is 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 paramount here um you know you can get several different behaviors out of of drones by by bolting on certain elements of software plank is is a, an absolute perfect example of that allowing it to take off and land from moving platforms and to track a whole raft of different other elements equally you know you look at pix 4d which is which is which is what jim's going to talk about here you're you're in this and, and sorry that's a para owned um element so it's a european company as well um gives you a huge amount of capability to actually deliver decision support elements imagery mapping everything that, that a, a real real um real short time frame and a lot of ease and then you're looking at synthetic training you know how do we how do we get around all these legalities of using drones within the real world, which prevents us from using drones in the way that we would do um, uh, within an operational context? You know, it's the old adage of train the way the way you want to fight. You know, we could learn bad lessons by by uh, not operating uh, or not working the way that we would want to do with operational environment. And then there's some other elements of, of software there, drone sense. Um, really cool piece of uh, software there. 2IC, which is great, and we'll, we'll talk about the integration side of it. And then at the bottom of it, SDK, which is which is other development platforms. This is a very fluid, very fast moving environment. I think this is where a lot of defense procurement traditionally, in its traditional context, would struggle to be able to keep momentum with, with, with how these commercial entities are, are evolving. So, without further ado, let's move on um, to 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 Recky. And and as I said before, this is 
predominantly where we see the drones that we're we're encountering are being used um, and that's largely focusing on the the visual sensors um, that, that those drones are carrying um, I know Asif from Parrot is listening in so hi Asif um, and and, uh, and and you know Parrot doing a great job uh, delivering some of these elements here um, Sam over to you mate yeah thanks Matt uh, hopefully everyone can uh, can hear me okay um, so when we're talking about drones for for recce and for these uh, these applications uh, it tends to be the uh, the smaller multi rotors so the short range recon drones and and yeah the parrot and that few range are the main ones that fit in that category which is what you can see uh, what you can see on the screen here um, so you've got the the standard uh, Anafi SE and Anafi Thermal SE, and then the, the newer and much improved uh, Anafi USA SE, which is the, the sort of latest, the most up-to-date version that's, that's currently available. So these are uh, primarily used um, from, from our side in, in, in public safety in tracking and identifying targets, search and rescue, and securing sites where there's incidents. So that leans itself really well towards uh, recce based applications as well so they have to be super lightweight they have to be really easy to use and maintain easy to carry very powerful um, hard to break as well as part of that so the NAFTA USA really is the current leader which is what you're seeing on the screen at the moment um, very lightweight weighs less, weighs less than 500 grams uh, really high powered thermal camera and a 32 times zoom camera on the visual so you can identify and track targets from um, anywhere up to a kilometre away, um, potentially more than that if it's vehicles as well. Uh, you've got an IP53 rating, so it can fly in rain, it can fly in strong wind, um, and it's fully encrypted, data secure, uh, built in the US. The manufacturers are based in, in France, in Paris, uh, and the supply comes from the UK. Um, so when you're looking at a, a product for tracking and identifying and using for recce, the Inafi USA currently is the is the best option, uh, the best option out there. The one that we, as copies and Brigantes, would would recommend that fits that uh, fits that category. And I think we've got the um, the next, if the next slide, the next uh, the next video is the uh, the Loki two. So this is um, again fits into that same category, but this is more based towards internal use. So this is internal an internal tactical drone. So the Loki 2 um, is effectively used for going in and clearing, clearing buildings and gathering data internally. So you can fly the drone in and use it as a, as a sentry within a building. So sit it in a location uh, and watch for movement. It's got a night vision camera. It flies entirely GPS denied. So it flies inside the building with no GPS, holds itself in position with all its sensors, uh, can take a real hammering. You know, you can crash it into anything, get bashed around. Uh, and you can flip it back over and, and keep flying. And again, a massive uh, a massive push towards security. So fully encrypted, all data secure, everything stored uh, within the drone uh, and everything fully encrypted. Um, so these two combined are the two main platforms that fit those two categories. Um, and then from there, you've got the smaller power systems like the standard and AFI, which fits into that as well. And then potentially some fixed wing options. And that's really your three main categories for drones for, for recce and, and all of those can be used for a much wider range of applications than just visual just sitting and watching um, but that's kind of the first step that's the initial uh, initial use case for them until we move on to the more more complicated stuff which we'll look at so sam i think the it's interesting to note that the currently the uh, anafi thermal se and anafi se uh, have been in, in use for a couple of years um people may wonder what the difference is between um between the se uh, and the the standard drone um and i think this is a good point just to to highlight the fact that you can go and find a, a normal non-se drone on uh, and, and buy that quite happily but there is a significant difference isn't there yeah, so so the, the standard ones, you're right, they're they're kind of off the shelf effectively. So so anyone can buy them. Uh, you can get them on Argos, Amazon, wherever else, uh, and operate those. Those versions don't have any of these SC security edition features, which are the ones that we provide into the into the military. So these have um, the, the most basic upgrade is is higher security and encryption. 
Um, other features are like it can be it can be flown completely data empty. So if the drone ends up in the wrong hands at all, there's nothing on it that can be that can be used, recorded, or, or stored. Um, but you can also override a bunch of security features which, which all standard commercial drones will have. So you can strip away um, it, its landing position, so it won't record where it took off from, and then there's no way for it to return to that point. Uh, for a normal operator, you'd always want that in place, but obviously in military applications, sometimes the last thing you want is the drone returning to where it took off from, uh, no matter what happens. Uh, you can you can push the SEs further before they um, fly them right to the limit before they decide to return to home. Uh, you can turn off all the landing lights and make it completely uh, completely dark when it's when it's operated. Um, and there's also an extension in the range of the system, a boost of the power between the drone and the controller as well. So those are the key, yeah, the key differences. And it's always it's always better to check that you're you're getting a version which is built for the military for defence use, rather than just going out and buying something uh, online, which is probably going to be not quite the right system for for what you're looking to do. And I think the when you talk about the USA, which is the the the, the, the obviously the latest version there, and, and that was specifically for a defence program. Uh, and therefore, it's the first of that family of drones, which which was entirely focused on on that. And I think we've certainly seen uh, from the trials and demonstrations and everything that we've seen that the 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 end user picking up the USA and seeing what that can do uh, in comparison to all the other drones and alongside the Loki that they offer a really nice uh, suite of drones. Um, but I think it's also important to know that these are really fast moving developments. You know, the, these products don't don't stay static for very long. Yeah, yeah, and, and to go back to what you said there, normally the drones that go into defence use, we see them, them built for commercial operations and then they're developed to be defence-based from there. With the ANAF USA, it went the opposite way. So as you said, it was developed for a Department of Defence contract. So it was, it was built for military use. Um, it was... It was stripped back down to make the commercial option, which is available for people to buy to, to use day to day. Um, but the military background and the and the defense applications that created the drone are kind of written throughout its its DNA. Um, and, and the main one of the main ways to show how quickly it's moving is that the amount of uh, power, for example, the thermal resolution within a drone that small. A couple of years ago, if you wanted thermal resolution of that level in a in a drone, you, you'd have something that was. 10 times the way, four or five times the cost, uh, and took five or six minutes to get set up. And now you've got a drone you can get in the air in, in less than a minute, and it'll fit practically in, in your pocket, which has that same level of, of quality. Great, and I think the the other thing we've seen, it'd be interesting to also discuss, you know, we've seen uh, some nano drones kicking around. And I think there was, there was a, a discussion that we had looking at why go for a slightly larger uh, sort of quadcopter around about the half kilo mark rather than something really really small and I think for me one of the one of the key things was its durability and stability you know ability to deal with with stronger wind conditions and looking at some of the environmental factors that these slightly larger drones can do when not only that and we'll talk about a little bit more with Phil about what they can actually carry yeah I mean this is the thing if you if you go for something um smaller which is as you said like a, a nano drone you're you're very limited in terms of future developments and future proofing so with the with the parrot drones the anafa usa not only are the payloads available now which as you said we'll, we'll talk about which can fit on but because there's access to the sdks the software software development kits there's always future developments being added on and because it can carry a payload it can be developed to do this um, and yeah, you're right, because it's slightly larger than, than these nano drones, it still has a lot of the benefits, but with the IP53 rating and the higher uh, level of wind resistance, um, yeah, you can operate them in, in conditions where normally you'd have to have a very uh, much larger, much more expensive drone system to do that. And now you can do it with something smaller, uh, more agile and, and cheaper, but it can still fly in those, those poor conditions. Cool. Uh, I can see quite a bit of activity going on the screen there, so um, I think uh, that is uh, Justin telling me to, uh, to 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 crack on. Um, uh, Sam, I think you've got Jim there, uh, but obviously not with you uh, precisely. But uh, Jim, do you want to uh, come in and, and talk to us about um, about the mapping side of things here? Yeah, and I, th I think with, uh, with with the development, sort of similar as uh, you touched on in the commercial sense, um, we like to capture data fast and efficiently and at speed. 
And this is where drones really come into their own. I'm certainly from the survey background I'm in and um, where the industry I came from. Um, yes, if we want a one to three mil survey, we're not going to use a drone. But in some of the applications which you guys are involved in, drones are just that fantastic tool to get that almost first eyes on on the ground. Let's assess this situation and let's analyze it and then plan accordingly. And the good thing about drones is that repeatability. We can fly it one week, we can return back the following week and then analyze them to results to give us that comparison. Do we need to change tactics? Do we need to really readdress the situation? And that's where that's where I feel drones are that fantastic tool to have in your tool bag in, in collaboration with other pieces of equipment as well. But, you know, they're quick. They're out of the pocket. Do you know what I mean? That they are that kind of fast, efficient tool to get information yeah. fast and efficiently. I think, I think the interesting thing, thinking about the, the, the operational environments that, that I've encountered, uh, you know, you, you are dependent on certain mapping. I remember going onto one operation and what all we had was naval charts. Uh, <laughs> so you're, you're limited with detail, which, which, was, which is a real challenge. Um, being able to have real time uh, uh, information about the ground in which you were covering, um, irrespective of whether that's trying to find um, any, 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 sort of enemy elements or distribution or anything like that is I think that's that's critical and, and as you point out being able to review an area and compare an area um, from one week to the next or day to the day is, is very interesting and, and certainly whether you're doing route recce's or which which is it can be a mapping function or whatever then then it gives you that freedom or the ability to be very much more situationally aware. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the things, you know, we, we know data is so important nowadays and certainly from a geospatial environment. If we can pinpoint where that data is and where that particular threat is, that can give us the upper hand in a, certainly a lot of applications. I think we're certainly from drones as well. There is that certain stealth ele element. So when you do start including high quality sensors, you can really fly at high altitudes and still maintain a very high GSD of around sort of a 1.5 centimetres which is phenomenal from such a high altitude. A good example, as with a traditional survey company only last week, we flew something like 120 acres in a 35 minute flight, which is incredible wow. from a, a very fast deployment to capture that data. Um, I know that's a bit more in the commercial sense, but all that data was captured, processed and delivered within a few hours, which is which in a traditional application that would have taken three weeks to, to survey. Yeah, and I think that's really important because it, what we're seeing is how forces developing are looking for smaller numbers covering a, a larger footprint. And I think moving into a, an area of operations and being able to give, you know, up to date detail with, on, on on that environment that they're sat within is is critical. Um, and certainly from some of the things we'll talk about a little bit later, it, it, it it's a, a key component to having a, a proper effect uh, yeah. from there. And absolutely, and I think with uh, we do know sometimes that processing time can be a bit of a hindrance. And I can see you've got Pix4D Mapper up there. Mm. Um, there's another software, Pix4D React, which is in tune for a bit more, I suppose, disaster relief, but will actually allow you to upload the data to their servers um, and process data through very quickly. So you have almost within minutes a full aerial view of that particular area, so you can make decisions even faster and quicker in the field. I think I think the interesting thing there you pick up. Of the, which, which is can sometimes be a concern from the point of view of a military end user is that connectivity requirement and i know one of the benefits with where uh, the pixel d team are based within switzerland and 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 how they're engaging is that being able to to work with these these developments particularly on a software point of view can be can be much much quicker um and uh, sam mentioned sdks these developments there was a couple of things we did just to do with getting uh, grid data uh, out of a Latin long and into an MGRS grid that was dealt with it within a couple of days by Parrot. Again, these similar ad adaptations. These these companies are very very fast moving and they're they're very open to to work with with organisations like ourselves or or even you know directly with the military to 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 adapt their their products to to make it more suitable uh, and make it more useful. And I think definitely, definitely, certainly in this world where drones is almost that buzzword at the moment and people are looking at so many different applications of where can drones be used and it ticks a lot of the boxes. And even for ourselves as a business, sometimes it's even hard for ourselves to keep up with new trends and what, what people are using with drones because, you know, you, don't, you only have to do small Google search and you see some really weird and wonderful things people are doing with drones. 
it's quite staggering. I mean, things like GPRs on drones now for uh, landmine detection and stuff like that, it really is it really is incredible. And, and I really still believe we're still at the very start of that industry. We've got years yeah. and years and years of, of progress to come, and it's it's really is exciting. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think finding, you know, experts from sort of fields like your your own and bringing them into the discussion rather than necessarily having the traditional um, methodology with how procurement is done or defence management is done, uh, you know, get to the people that are are doing the development as quickly as possible is 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 definitely the way to go. So we talked about Pix 4D Mapper there, uh, and you mentioned the, the being able to cover that space within, within the 35 minute uh, window, which is which is exceptional. Um, if we move on to the, the next uh, element of it, um, and I think there's something that, that probably take a little bit more time to talk through, and that's linked to mapping, but it's surveying. Um, and, and this is this is whether you're an engineer or whether you're needing specific data on a target that you're trying to get. I think this is a fascinating element that, that's available through actually what is really, really very accessible technology. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we push on next, I think it goes to talk on about um, Pix4D capture. So, Jim, what have we got here, mate? Yeah. So this, 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 this for me, where traditionally kind of I suppose survey applications was down to a surveyor with a lot of knowledge and understanding using traditional um, tech, uh, traditional instruments. With using apps like Pix4D capture, it allows somebody probably with not necessarily that survey background to be able to operate easy and efficiently and capture high quality data in the field without having to undergo extensive amount of training or doing courses and stuff like that. I mean, I know guys operating in this field of survey with very limited knowledge of survey, but they're able to go out using this kind of um, software and data capture um, uh, uh, software to be able to collect that data. And, and I think that's where it's come now into that space where um, anyone with a uh, a, a limited knowledge can capture high quality survey grade data. Yeah, I, I, know, I vividly remember, you know, we did, we actually went and worked with 2-9 Commando and, and did a survey of their of, of the Citadel, uh, mm -hmm. which which was which gave a beautiful render. Um, uh, my technology te technological ability is limited, so I, I did have to send all the data to you, Jim. But but it was <laughs> it was it was very very easy to do. I mean, we did it in a very very um yeah. high detail things so it took a bit of time but there was one which could do a quick 360 and and get stuff and i think this one this one here is uh Kathmandu actually i believe um but it is a, for an urban area as much and you can see how there's a little bit dust distortions this was done quite quickly but looking at the 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 potential of future operating environment and and you know what <laughs> it's a perfect example of where we might find ourselves working in the ground but being able to do a survey of that area and look at all the all the elements of it is is a level of data we've never been able to have before absolutely and i think like looking at something like that a data set yes you can pick a few faults and go well it's it's a bit blurry in places but first of all if you've got no data on that area before it ticks that box straight away you're not going in blind and do you necessarily really need to know if there's a, a, a bin bag or a bin in an area, anything like that? You wouldn't be able to see, right, there's X amount of buildings there, four or five stories high. And then that gives you that it's certainly a, enough information to start that planning process. And I think when you hit on that sort of data you sent for us ourselves, I suppose we've kind of, I suppose you're kind of, I suppose, limited in terms of drone fly and that kind of thing. You captured some very high quality data with, with minimal effort. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think this is this is where the um, the software, the real cleverness of the software and the system is that this it didn't take me to personally pilot the drone. It was a case of there you are, there's your task. That's what I want you to cover and get on with it. Uh, and that's that's true of of of, of a lot of the drones, but uh, but it's it's this software that allows us to do. And I think that's that's a key point when looking at lots of different software uh, that they increase the automation of the device and decrease the skill level that's required by the by the end user so that's mm -hmm. super super important and uh, and very very useful but i think from a couple from of me couple of questions guys sorry yeah, just jumping please. in there a couple of couple of questions um first questions come in uh with regards to mapping with multiple drones um so can you use them in conjunction with one another to build out the maps um and then the second one about tactical level ied surveys for clearance patrols whether or not the uh, the accuracy of the drones can be used for those. 
So certainly you can use uh, uh, data sets from multiple drones and merge them together. Um, that, that's no issue at all. And that's traditionally done in survey applications, certainly on big areas or, or multiple flights as well. It um, would probably fall, fall into the same context of that. Um, in terms of the IED stuff, probably not my bag, but if there's a scenario, I could probably try and, <laughs> try and help. I, I can help there. So, so there actually, there's some interesting little things that we're, we're now starting to look at. And it's different sensors. And there was a there was a parrot drone called the bluegrass. Um, and the bluegrass is actually a, a, a farming drone, believe it or not, uh, that's, that's set up to look at the maturity of crops. And it does, does that by the reflected light that's coming off that, that vegetation. Interestingly enough, when we looked at it, you could see disturbed earth. Now, mm -hmm. now that was that gave a very, very different render. It was it gave a, a picture that was to the uninitiated would look like a, 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 a thermal map, basically. Yeah. Um, but it highlighted certain key areas. The other thing is, and, and looking at the, the cameras that you've seen on the previous drones, that using the level of whether it's using the visual data or the thermal data. So obviously, if you're hiding a device under the ground, it has uh, a potentially has a, a different thermal signature than what you would see necessarily with the naked eye. Um, so so that those kind of tools can be used. So using a, a, a pre-recce of a route before you go on patrol for check for IEDs, absolutely. And, and frankly, any eyes is going to be great, uh, much better. But the, the, um, the level of quality on the cameras, so take the Anafa USA at the moment, there's, there's two visual cameras which are uh, are both both Sony cameras, and one gives the really really high level of uh, 4K detail and 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 uh, information, uh, and then the other one is a is a is a is a wide screen or a wide pan uh, camera, and then on top of that you've got uh, the thermal camera. Now the on the visual side you can do 32 times zoom, so even from a relatively good distance away you, you're getting to see some real uh, some real detail there. Um, but that, that's, I mean, that's not unusual necessarily with, with drones of this space, uh, but looking at this particular software we're looking at here, to get a detailed survey, which would be the kind of thing I did with the Citadel, mm -hmm. the smaller the area, the quicker it's obviously going to take, take place because it builds a pattern, a, a pathway for it to go. And actually some of the detail there was, 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 was pretty good. Whether you'd be able to get it right down to seeing super, super small items, not sure at this moment of time. I think that would have to depend on conditions, light, obscured areas, uh, and and how many flights you could do over it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fly closer, pick up more detail, but then it's always that outweighs of the processing time, file size afterwards. But I think the other interesting thing here is that we're only now just starting to get to understand the problems that we're encountering because because these, as we say, we're only now making drones specific to the military end user. So as more problems are 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 revealed or more tasks revealed, then the development can go in to make that even better. Uh, and as I say, there's a variety of different sensors that are being used for many, many different tasks. Uh, so that's definitely something to go forward from there. Anyway, G Jim, thanks, can Jim. I, can I, can, uh, did, uh, Matt, sorry, uh, Steve Coulson here. Um, yeah, the, the, question, the question was also the uh, regarding the using multiple drones to build up that map. Now, Jim, um, as far as I understand, they can stitch that information together from multiple drones to build up a bigger picture um, yeah multiple yes. drones multiple sources uh, i mean someone like pix 4d as long as that imagery is geotagged and that camera model's known you you can put as many different data sets from different drones in there um as you wish and pix 4d will sort that sort that element out for you great brilliant thanks jim oh, so thanks. Let's move on to uh, talk about command and control. Uh, and I'm gonna bring in uh, Graham uh, from 2IC here. Um, now, um, drones are actually just one type of sensor that can give us data and information. But what's what's really, really important about, particularly on-demand drones, is, is to make that information useful throughout the command chain. Um, very, very easy to get it within tactical space because it's very real, very immediate. Um, but to be able to scale it through the command structure, you've got to achieve that integration. So, Graham, this is your area. And I think, you know, from your point of view, looking at how you build these things together, how do you see drones supporting the C2 element within, within the military? Yep, yeah, hello everyone. Um, I think this is a really important part of it, particularly how you use the on-demand on drone, both in the local operator, in their wider team, and then right the way back up through the command structure. 
So as an example, some work we've been doing with one of the Five Eyes Nations, they've got the operator using the drone um, to look at around the back of a building, for example, and when they're very operational. But often the case is the pilot of the drone is the one who in the team who least needs to see the imagery, needs to know where it is. So they need to better share it with other members of their team. And then potentially being able to join that but up, up to higher command to get um, wider assets in, such as um, fires, whether it be naval fire, other aircraft support. Being able to get that richer information up to other people just means that you get a greater effect quicker, you can get more people involved. The bit where we fit in as well is you can't do that by making the whole thing a manual process. You need to be able to automate that discovery. You need to be able to on the fly discover there's a drone, someone's just popped up a drone there. So someone else higher up in the command chain can suddenly see on their map, hey, look, there's a drone in that rough area. I want to go and have a look at it. I want to see what they can see. All of that without interfering with any of the stuff that's going on. So that's, that's the sort of area where you can really start. If you have that automation of systems, you can join them up right away from the individual guy on the ground flying the drone, linking that image right the way back up to um, assets such as the aircraft there, so that giving better targeting information or just that better situational awareness of knowing what's around, where it's around. I think I think we we chatted about a couple of scenarios. One was at the local level. Um, you know, you're sat there with a, a a tablet on your chest, and and you're working off a a six inch screen, uh, being able to or needing to make some immediate decisions. And and you mentioned it there, being able to see within that what drones within that space and passively piggyback their their information feed, see the camera that's going on. Now, obviously, that's going to be an aid to decision making within the immediate environment. But even when you're going stepping back to platoon or troop or, or company level or, or there above, you know, being able to, uh, without having to request a situation or a, a sit rep, being able to go in and get that information, look, see what that subunit is doing, seeing what they're seeing. Um, and I think the other thing here is that, that there's an, an element of a very key element of anticipation here as well, um, where where we can see what's going to go, what's happening. There's been an IED strike or whatever. We know what's going on. We can key up those key elements. You don't need to wait for the nine line for, for the MERT or for, for whatever else to, to actually affect the response. So so that, that ability to speed up the decision making through the command chain. But I think also rather than having a huge amount of information that has to be processed at each level in order to filter out what's, what's relevant, I think being able to go and I'm going to have a look at that camera. I'm, you know, allowing the commander to choose that piece of information he wants to see, rather than coming over a voice net uh, with on a, on a written report form and, and and having to deal with it there. So, so that I think there's a there's very much as the arrow shows a huge two-way interoperability opportunity here. And I know from the command and control side, you know, the guys on the ground using them already are, are doing this to further enhance their ability. You know, from simple tools like you know putting a a sniper in dead ground observing the enemy and only only potentially moving the sniper forward into position when when the when the target set is 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 correct um to you know going up further up now currently larger drone systems are being used within within the the command infrastructure um i don't know the level of success they've been having at the moment with getting the smaller drones uh, and, and even smaller cameras whether that's a mohawk on a helmet or whatever but i know the the army have been looking at that to support uh, the medical side of things. So information being key, but not information drenching. It's It's got to be information uh, sorting or sorted. Um, so so that's certainly something yeah. that would, would be super useful. Absolutely. I think it, it drives down to you want to put the operator at the heart of the decision making. So if, if it's the operator on the ground or the commander, rather than trying to push information to people, it's to try and allow people to see what information could be available and let them go out and look for it. So work we're doing with another partner is it, it's aircraft based, but it could just as easily be onto the drones. On the ATAC device, they can see all the video feeds that are available in the area, yeah, every asset that's up. They can see where it is. They can see what video feeds it's being offered. Is it a, a thermal imagery? Is it a, 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 what sort of types of camera? Where where the field of view is? And be able to just pick the one automatically and automatically tune their, um, their ATAC, their rover systems, anything else they've got attached, they start getting that video feed. Rather than having to try and jump on a voice radio as you're saying, go, right, has anyone got eyes on this? Has anyone got eyes on that? Can you send me, you know, all those sort of things. That just slows things down. And by the time you've got through, everyone's given up, to be honest, it's too hard. The, the other one then is even on, on the drone one, if you've got two teams, two two people in the team, if they've got a guy, guy in his ATAC, what I really want is eyes on there. 
clicking the dot on the map and they're sending that dot over the drone pilot automatically so he knows exactly where to fly to rather than trying to jump on a, a voice radio and trying to give a grid ref and do all that if, if the pilot just sees a dot on the map and saying hey boss wants to see here it's an awful lot easier for him to fly to that point and get the eyes on and removes all that ambiguity and ambiguity is error so it just cuts that down I think one of the things fascinating discussions we had about was to do with battle space management actually and it's a big debate um how do you manage the space where you've got lots of moving objects in the in, in that element whether that's munitions whether that's helicopters fast jets and whatever and i think the the this interconnectivity and, it, and it's taking legacy systems and connecting them with current systems so it's it's that translation service that you can do so if you're hypothetically speaking if you're a, a helicopter pilot operating within a, a certain given ao that you would be able to identify what drones are in that in that space and exactly where they are um, without uh, any problem yeah absolutely and those are the things and then vice versa for the, the drone pilot just getting an alert there's a helicopter or a larger asset coming into his area even then the pilot immediately knows that to start doing something about it either way there so it's just increasing that situation awareness and situation awareness is a lot more than a little dot on the map it's that whole thing around it to help basically help the, the, the troops on the ground make those better decisions and the better information and, and, when they need it the better decision they make i think the the fascinating thing is it, it, it comes across quite a grand um aspiration in some ways but i, I don't think this is that dif difficult to to really make happen you know so how yeah, easy would it to be to start to integrate these elements so for fear of using other buzzwords we take a very sort of agile approach you start small you integrate a couple of things you put the, the basics in there and then you add things on you add things on and if you try some things and they don't quite work how you wanted you can roll back you can add on other things and the, you keep the stuff that gives you operational benefit if, if, if it's not helping you stop doing it do something else and you have that very much iterative approach to building up that capability and i think certainly in the drone space that's exactly where we need to go at the moment we're starting to use them they've got benefit we'll start finding more and more use and you just need to be able to scale that both, both in terms of how you use them and where you use and that scale will grow and you need to better just do that over time as you learn but that time could be hours and days not decades as we've often seen in defense procurement you need to do that really quickly and scale up as you learn and as the, the mission changes the operation and the assets change yeah i think so and i think i think what's key about a lot you know all these all these people within this space uh, and within this technological space are used to moving that fast uh so so yeah no, i think getting these these connections elements done is 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 critical from from a command point of view from, from thinking about from my background yeah cool. absolutely it's, it's just doing things quickly and i think and then it's that agility change it to change to do what's working cool thanks graham um we'll go on to the the next area which is which is linked uh and i'm gonna ask rob taylor to jump in here as well um uh, so the from the planning side the what we've seen so far is we can generate a huge amount of planning support products uh whether that's mapping whether that's imagery both real time um beforehand before an event and, and to build up from there and, and and obviously that we can make that available to the to the the infantry commander on the ground who needs to make a quick decision about what needs to be done and, and help them assure that get a better quality decision out of there to to those that are in a joint effect, uh, joint operating cell or, or whatever within within that strata um the reason i want to bring uh, uh rob in because he has a, a kind of a, a unique take on how that data can then be brought in to rehearse and plan and and and, and actually have a much better opportunity a successful outcome on an operation rob do you want to take off from there mate well, I think actually Graham sort of led me in quite well there is the, the way Graham's looking at how the technological innovation and, and sort of combination works. I think it's sort of critical to how we do it effectively is if you if you dump a complete solution on a dismounted close combat commander in three years time, just before they deploy on whatever operation is at the time, you're setting them up for failure. Whereas if you iterate slowly and slowly build up, you know, sort of the key is, I think, with this technology is to get, like Graham said, small amounts out early and then iterate gradually. Because what you can do with all this data, is exactly like you said, is you start to pull it in to the art of the possible of what the commander can actually achieve implodes. Uh, sorry, explodes, not implodes. But the issue with that is that needs to be done without imploding. Excuse the sort of misuse of terminology, the wrong order. But 
effectively what we need to get to is a point where through training and iteration i'll cover this a bit later in the presentation on by sort of rapidly going through iteration after iteration after iteration on how the data is used how it's disseminated and how it's spread you're going to actually empower the commander rather than overwhelming them and i think one of the points graham sort of mentioned which is critical is not getting stuck from a sort of defense procurement sense and the analysis paralysis of going after the perfect solution and trying to deliver that whole meal rather than to iterate gently and the great sort of examples the ATAC view that we're looking at there is uh, I'm sort of more from the dismounted situation awareness rather than just specifically an ATAC but what mm. information do we offer to the commander and looking at that from a perspective of going through various scenarios looking at how much he's using it, how much they are using it, how much they're not using it do we add stuff do we subtract stuff and that needs to just grow gradually and I think to do that it's you, you sort of uh, introduce the team as a sort of collective group of experts that's the sort of i think approach that's going to enable that rather than getting one specific um uh, behemoth to do that in a way that is going to deliver a solution and then you're going to hit a failure or success sort of yes or no rather than actually doing it iteratively and like graham said if you go too far something goes wrong you step back and you go in a different direction so i think yeah, in terms of how that task planning can work getting to a point where we actually work with the end users and sort of iterate gently, gradually. So when they do deploy onto whatever operation they're going onto, this is a system that effectively has been developed in combination, not in isolation. Yeah, I, I, I think that's too important. I think the other interesting thing, thinking about the the relevant the relevance of the information that's coming in and and uh, just reflecting in the past, where you know, I mean, the question about doing root recies was is a perfect one, where you're trying to think, well, is this is this the correct way to go? Can I get a level of assurance without giving away my intent, uh, and and therefore, can I look at the options not just on my primary route, but also what what the other elements are around? Uh, and I'm talking about it from a lower tactical level here, obviously. Um, and uh, and you're right, you know, some of the things you're going to show us later about how you can then build that in for a very um, uh, discrete task you know a, a very specific task um and, and you saw it with jim about being able to see a, a building and, and a structure and some of those renders were were very detailed others were, were less detailed depending on, on the capability but they all add to the understanding and the real-time understanding uh, of the situation the number of times where you step off a helicopter and go hang on a minute this doesn't look anything like what 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 we thought we we're doing and it's not always to do with because you land, you're, you've been dropped off in a different place than you thought. Um, so, so I think that's that, you know, super interesting and super important. But I think also you, as you, as you and Graham both point out, this ability to look at it with no consequence, fail, tech, try, come back, and and then and improve and go forward uh, on that integration side, and the drones being a part of that uh, uh, architecture. Uh, so yeah, no, that's 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 super super useful. Um, cool, Justin. Have we got any more? Any other questions at this moment in time? Any specifics? No, most of them have actually been answered as we've gone through. Uh, we've got a um, quick question here for Graham though. Uh, how do users go about implementing 2IC? Is there any way that they can implement this already in the systems, or is it a infrastructure change that needs to occur? It's it's not it, it it's not an infrastructure change. So, um, quite important. It's a software overlay. So we add software to existing systems. So as a good example, some work we're doing with um, US forces at the moment is on their existing um, end user devices, some of their existing plat platforms. We're just adding a software layer on top of it, so it integrates with the radio systems they're already using, the systems they're using. So it's very much a software add-on to whatever they've got there. Um, it, and elements of it come down to things that are directly usable by the operator so they can do some of the configuration you know press button configuration themselves for example so really trying to drive that down to make it as easy as possible for the operator and not have to put huge amounts of new stuff in certainly no new hardware and it's just software add-ons to things that are already in place hopefully cool. that answers the question <laughs> thanks okay so um moving on to uh phil um, so Phil from Typhon, just to remind everybody, uh, is you know looking at payloads, uh, and we're going to start with your sort of your um, your core competency where you started from, which was distraction essentially with on with on with on, with on drones. Um, Phil, over to you. Okay, so we've heard already about um, sort of mapping and uh, recce. 
what um, what we bring with Typhon is uh, is a range of payloads. So you know, concentrating on the man portable, um, very lightweight, uh, and you're talking about uh, distraction payloads that uh, are sort of around 100 grams for the first first iteration, up to what you're seeing on the video there on the Loki 2, which is uh, 135 grams. So you've you've got uh, the ability there with um, five events, and each separate event is 169 decibels. Um, low flash, low fragmentation. So it's about reducing the risk to the operator, but also putting some distance between the operator and the potential target. I think one of the other speakers, I think it could have been Jim, um, was also talking about um, you know, pinpointing targets. So whilst you also sort of think about distraction as as, as sort of giving that effect and, and taking somebody's attention away from what you're trying to do you can also use it to attract and to pinpoint as well so there are different uses for this this type of kit um, you know we we started off developing these particular payloads for um, counter terror units and for for, for breaching teams um, so effectively that first man in he could put a drone in you use the camera for the surveillance but then you also got the ability to affect the target as well uh, buy yourself some more time um, as, as you as you go into a room or into a building and you're clearing through. Um, so I think with a lot of these things, it's giving additional capability and the fact that it is so small, um, it really fits into you know what Matt was saying right back at the beginning about the man portability of this and just adding additional tools to the platforms as the platforms develop. Um, so so on, on that, you, I, think you're, I think I'm right saying there are what, 180 decibels they're kicking out at? Just short of 170. So you've got five yeah. times 170 dB um, kicking out on, on each of the cartridges that are fired from these devices. Um, the other advantage with it is because it's under electronic control, you can actually, we can play with the timings. So if you wanted to make it sound like a five round semi-auto burst, that's possible. If you want to split it up and actually have it as a single event, um, so you know one bang, move the drone to a separate area, se second bang, all of that is possible. The other advantage with it and, and the things that we're working on at the moment are we can either have the RF control of the unit as a separate standalone additional man in the loop. So the drone pilot can focus on flying the drone. Another man in the team can, can actually operate the distraction device or with the Loki 2 particularly that you see on the screen there, that's fully integrated. So the, the control of the, the system is fully integrated into the the Sky Hero GCS. So the operator can actually arm fire and control the distraction device as he flies the drone as well. Um, depending on the type of operation and the type of end user requirement, we're able to, to integrate fully or keep it standalone depending on what level of safety or, or, or other things need to be in, in, the, in the mix. I think, I think from a point of view of a commander on the ground, I think being able to have a tool that does a does, does one job really well being able to then add other jobs to it is is always going to be helpful when reducing the the, the amount of kit that we have to carry uh, and i think you know you, you talk about from the counter terror point of view of, of having that inside a building um and, and using that as a as a it's, it's quite a substantial uh, noise um to say the least uh, which is you know thinking it from the point of view going right back to sort of when i was learning putting in troop attacks and whatever you know pushing being able to push a couple of drones off to a side to generate a noise is, is and a significant noise is 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 a, is a great element without having to actually put any troops to that so a force multiplier uh, certainly um i think the other cool thing that you, you're doing here is these these additional elements how it can you know it can, can engage with these 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 drones and it's and 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 simplify the process uh without without any real problems at all um yeah. if we I, don't, I think I think the other thing. Go, go, Phil. Sorry, Matt. No, go on. Um, so, literally, just leading into the kinetic side of things. So, so where we we came from was uh, distraction, developing the equipment for specific needs. Where you know, so whether it's close quarters, whether it's that sort of breaching first in through the door uh, type of operation. So, Typhon's background was very much around the the, the, the non or less lethal um, product development, payload development with additional partners that we have both in the UK and, and the US um, and additional requirements and particularly driven out of a requirement from um, the, the US um, SF community is there was um, a statement from, from one area of that um, or one agency who had said our enemies are using 
this type of equipment. You know, a lot of it is you know jury rigged onto um, you know very basic drones, but they're they're strapping on explosives and and you know affecting you know our operatives. How can we develop something, or can we develop something that can counter that? So. I suppose our product roadmap and, and what we're looking at developing now are, are energetic or kinetic solutions that can be deployed from a range of different drone sizes. So you can have your man portable, your man packable and carryable small drone um, with a very small energetic or kinetic payload on there, right the way, and that could be scalable, right the way through to something that can carry 15, 20 kilos and you sort of medium, larger size drone platforms. So, you know, we're looking at uh, encrypted RF. Um, we've got uh, various developments at the moment as, as looking at the different initiation circuits. Um, again, either fully integrated into the ground control unit um, for the drone itself or standalone. Um, so you've got another man in the loop. Um, but again, you know, from sort of say a payload of two devices that are equivalent to, to the drone carrying two um, 40 millimeter rounds um, all the way up to 18. Um, rounds and, and they, those rounds, those energetics or those kinetic effects, it could be, you know, high explosive, it could be smoke, it could be, you know, the, if it can be imagined, then the potential is there to, um, you know, to, to develop something. So, you know, very much where Typhon are, are, are actually sort of looking at the payload capabilities, looking at developing the release mechanisms, and then our partners who are skilled in, in the energetic side are very much looking at well what effect can we get into that that size and size and weight envelope that um you know doesn't trade off too much in terms of the the flight time of the platform you know versus what you need to to um to achieve operationally yeah no I and i think revealing sort of the potential hor not horizon that's that's the right but what the next potential steps are um when we start to bring all these things together in one in one context and and, and open this forum for discussion, then 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 it does really start to drive forward the opportunities that are there. And and I think the principles have have been proven with with the previous payloads that you've worked on, um, mm. but actually being able to deliver something from a what is a really really small bit of plastic effectively, uh, yeah. and relatively speaking very very cheap at, at distance with a lower risk and low effect. Well, there we are, perfect. Um, yeah. to, to, to the uh, to, to, to the end user, then it does enable them to have an impact much greater than they would have traditionally had to have been able to, uh, and at much much lower risk. So I think that's um, you know a really exciting part of development. And I know it's been something that's been worked on for a little bit of time, um, and, and it'll be really interesting to see what the how how it then grows from here, uh, particularly with such the interest in in, in these kinds of, kinds of technology. And I think the other key thing as well, I think a couple of the other panelists have already picked up on it, is that um, you know, around drone technology and drone manufacturers, uh, you know, it's a, it's a relatively um, sort of new technology, but but very fast moving. Um, and, and I think, you know, certainly what we've seen from our initial developments and, and where we started from you know, only you know, two, three, four years ago to where we are now, um, you know, we're, it's like night and day. But mm. a lot of that is based on end user and operator feedback. So, you know, yeah. we, we've, we've launched something to the market. The market said, we like that, but we wish it could do this or that, or we don't like this bit. Um, and because we're, you know, to, to, to coin um, one of Graham's words, we're, we're, we're an agile organization, um, as are most of the, the other organizations involved in this field, we're able to respond very quickly to, um, to end user requirements. Um, yeah. So you don't have that, that 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 sort of long churn. We're not trying to force something into the market. We're we're basing it on you know, market feedback and developing something and, and developing the tools forward based on what the actual guys on the ground need um, to to achieve you know the best outcome for themselves. No, and, but I think the I think you're right to raise that the end user engagement is critical to the quick development here. Uh, and, and trying to do that directly, working through subsidiaries is always a bit of a challenge in, in, in that case. So getting the, the, the people who are actually developing the elements, whatever that is, straight in front of the end user is, is, is critical. Uh, and that does does result in, in good effect quickly. Um, and, and yeah, I, no, it's, 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 it's fairly obvious, but, but very important. No, that's great, Phil. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So, so that, Phil, obviously we're talking about kinetics from the point of view of kinetics directly from a drone. How can you use a drone to support kinetic effect 
from a third party, if you like. Um, now, this was an area where um, Cy Oliver from Forsberg was going to come over, and, and Cy has a background with it, with his ex artilleryman. Um, I'm going to talk through this, so, but unfortunately, obviously, he can't make it. So, I am going to do my level best to bring it to speed, but the principles are, 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 are fairly, fairly um, easy to understand. Um, basically, what you're looking for to, in order to be able to pass on the data to a, a an, an end effect, whether that's an F-35, mortars, artillery, NGS, or whatever it is, you need to be able to give them the, the, the correct data, the correct grid in order to be able to fire apart. Now, in that way, you have to be able to ratify that grid. Now, what, what the system that Forsberg are working with, which is Mantis, is, is, is actually uses a system where it takes the data from the drone, and it may be the drone that's done the find uh, and has identified a, 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 um, a target. It then uses the uh, position of the drone with the projected position of that, that image that it's taken, and it overlays it with a number of different sources. Um, it, some are as simple as Google Maps, and others that are a little bit more, 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 uh, more difficult to, to, for the layperson to get hold of. <clears throat> and by doing that, they overlay this and cross-reference that data to be able to give a, a very, very high quality of, of uh, targeting data that can then go forward uh, to the command side of it. Now, what that also does is that when you're passing that data up, essentially, instead of using, laser, say, a laser target designator, which is something that has been discussed as a potential payload, um, you're, you're then using the the hardware that is, hard, is, is part of a normal drone anyway. And all you're doing is you're taking the visual data, bear in mind that these cameras are very, very high uh, resolution, and being able to convert that data into grid references and, and therefore a, a fire mission that can then be passed over or put, inputted into the, the, the normal systems that the artillery or the mortars uh, or, or, or the aircraft would be using to deliver that payload. Um, from there, obviously you've got eyes on the target as well. So, so being able to use that, that drone to look at the effect of that round be able to potentially do adjustment. I know there's just trials ongoing. Um, and where it's a classic case from a very manual point of view of choosing a grid on, on, a, on a map, uh, which actually you could do anyway now from this drone, it, from the drones, and it will give you a 10 figure grid. Um, but then, and then go from necessarily using good old binoculars and, 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 and the graticals in it to do the adjustment. You know, the drones can start to do some of those those elements and there is opportunity for development to be able to to make that adjustment more automatic and, and, and simpler for the end user um, uh, to to achieve the effect that they want. So looking at here, you know, and again, this is part of the integration side of it as well. You know, drawing that information into the command of the control, understanding the target agent, you can see a number of different images here. Um, and, and some of the key ones to, to look at, you can see that they've used the Google Google Earth maps to provide a 3D render where you can see the relief of the town of the, of the, of the, of the ground. And that's actually a, a, a mortar control uh, element there. So you can see the vertex uh, height of the, of, the, of the mortar round. You can see how it will affect whether it's, it, you know, how, it, how you bring that uh, um, element to bear. Um, and then on the on the left hand side, lower down, you can see artillery and, and, and actually an air mapping um, element there as well. So this is using digital um, elements and it's using sensors of which drones couldn't be one of them, but a very useful one in this instance uh, to support the targeting data and to speed up the process. Uh, so rather than me getting on the on the net and giving a traditional line nine line with with the the grid that I've got and all the elements that's there and equally, or if I'm trying to control air, trying to talk air into it, be able to give them a much better feel straight away for the information that's there. And I think it's fair to say that if we're trying to use a, a voice system to pass over information, we're, we're, we're losing the battle straight away. We're now in the, in the, in the business of trying to achieve a, a completely digital kill chain. So that information, like Graham mentioned, you pick up the, the image from a camera or on a drone, and that can be seen all the way up to, you know, wherever it needs to be uh, to process to essentially deliver this kind of, of detail. That further reduces the burden on the guys on the ground. Um, so a really, really interesting, interesting system. And, and, and I really don't do it justice to what, what Ollie does 
talk about. And, and I know he's been doing some really interesting stuff with 2.9 and, and, and other guys. And this system has been um, originated from the Scandinavian nations and is, is used in a number of different nations around the world. Um, so definitely worth something looking at, but it's, it's a good example where a standalone piece of software or system can be enhanced by the, this, using the sensor that is available on, on that drone. Uh, and there we are. We can't can't get away with a a, a, a lovely few pictures of, uh, of, of 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 something gratuitous like F F thirty fives and whatnot. Um, so, but as as and I had a good chat with Ollie beforehand. You know, if you want to have a chat with a good chat with Forsberg about this, then then by all means we'll pass on those details as well. Uh, and as I say, he will go into much much greater detail. Um, if we move on from there, um, and I'm going to bring. Bring, bring Rob back in uh, to talk about uh, training environments, basically, or training with drones. Great. So uh, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll talk away as the video sort of plays in the background. But I think as we've seen so far, drones are going to be the future of sort of the combined arms environment. And, and we believe as such training uh, needs to be conducted as regularly and realistically as possible um, in order to achieve mission success. And we believe there are sort of three key strands to that, which sort of rotate back to points that various panelists have discussed sort of throughout this uh, uh, presentation so far. I mean, what you're seeing here is effectively the ability to blend the synthetic and the physical training environments to sort of enhance what you can do based on a sort of limited floor space. But the first of those three spaces, we believe, is one that Matt uh, highlighted early on, which is overcoming the constraints posed by existing training areas. And effectively to do that, I think you're starting to look at potentially hybrid synthetic training uh, solutions and i think the, the group on this call are probably at the cutting edge of that capability and i'll go on to that in a bit more detail uh, uh, now i think the second element sort of you focus on the training quality is then the training frequency and we believe the ability for users to train on barracks or at their sort of primary place of work rather than relying on get deploying two main training areas to do it is going to be key to that and to do that we need a sort of uh, a disaggregated approach to to training uh, and as such, creating this sort of integrated synthetic environment is going to be critical uh, to that mission success. And what you've effectively just watched there is a sort of short minute video of how you can have individuals in the physical, i.e. in the real world, and individual and, and capabilities in the synthetic. There you saw a sort of parrot interface drone being used in a combined manner to create a complete synthetic battle space. And the ambition, we believe, should be the end users should be able to train whenever and wherever they need without even really being able to notice whether the drone they're controlling in this instance is physical or synthetic so effectively the interface that they're controlling in the real world is exactly the same as they would be, be it on operations or in training but the effect and what they're witnessing could be virtual or could be real but effectively it will look the same linking this to existing infrastructure such as you know from our background shoe houses makes this even more potent so imagine not being able to uh, not only being able to see a synthetic version of the physical training space but also sort of create an effect in the physical by, as we've just heard, engaging and defeating that target with the type and kinetic effect. So imagine being able to see a synthetic representation of a physical target, as you're seeing here, then being able to engage it synthetically in a safe synthetic environment, have an effect so the operators or soldiers on the ground see that target full. Which leads ultimately, I think, into the third and, in our opinion, most exciting aspect of training, and that is the use of drones. In, and that is the fact that the use of drones in warfare is relatively new. And as a result, we believe TTPs are relatively embryonic in terms of how these can be used. And one limitation to the development of these TTPs is clearly the frequency of use. And being able to regularly, objectively, and repeatedly run scenarios is crucial to sort of the rapid iteration that we've discussed, but specifically of tactics. By working with D3A, a key member of this team, who's a specialist in combined arms simulation and targetry, we can analyze and test how drones can be used to control combined arms through simulation, constantly iterating, until close combat leaders are able to manage the combined arms buff space more competently and more easily than their adversaries. And in our view, revolutionizing both how and how well you can target and execute. So effectively, it's trying to take what is going on in the physical and bring in a synthetic element. So instead of only using drones when the battalion deploys to Salisbury Plain three times a year, turning drone usage into an activity as frequent as, say, PT in the morning. So, you know, you do your hours PT, then you go to a, a blended synthetic environment and train on a drone for two hours. You know, can you imagine a platoon commander, platoon sergeant, section commander calling in five or six fire missions before lunch, you know, and then iterating that out over the year rather than doing that maybe three times a year? 
so that's sort of the way we look at training so I think the, you, 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 first of all, you bring up Craig from D3A, and, and, and they're, they're really engaged in a fantastic world within, within defence already. And I think this, this supports the training environment and, and helping training occur in a very, very different way. Um, and, and again, you, you, you use a really good reference point. Training doesn't, you don't have to go out to train. If you can, if you can do that training at home and, and achieve the think and, and, Get that muscle memory that you're using those elements and bringing those elements together i think it was all what was also really fascinating by and you did a, a, a an excellent webinar um very uh, not, not that long ago actually um was the ability for people to essentially be sat anywhere within well, within where they can get wi-fi connection and be able to train together yeah. now if we think about the current situation we've got units that haven't been able to do any real training because of because of lockdowns and whatnot well actually from this point of view they could have been training on the drones every single day. Uh, the other thing, the really, really key thing here, there's a number of drones that, you know, the guys seem to like to, well, they, they eat drones, it, I've, I've come to the conclusion. Um, so there are loads of drones that are being repaired or whatever, and whether that's an angry buzzard has decided that it's got an objection to a drone in its airspace, perfectly understandable, um, or, or whatnot, then, then actually using them in the physical environment comes with a certain element of risk. And then layer on top of it, the fact that they can't go out of line of sight. They can't do all these other elements with the drones that they would like to do. And, and then again, you talk about what Phil's point of view, and, and this is something that you and I, Rob, you and I have chatted about fairly recently, being able to play with effects, you know, seeing, well, what happens if I do put a payload on that drone? How can that be practiced and rehearsed and worked through? Exactly. And I think the, you know, one of the key aspects is you mentioned training and it's turning training into a TTP development rather than just to training the TTP, if that makes any sense. You sort of flip training round. And, you know, I think looking at using Typhon, for instance, as an example, is a really useful one in terms of we talk about sort of soft distraction. You know, the drone is inherently a distraction, could be a distraction on its own. And then when it gets closer, you have the distraction device. What, what are the standoffs of that? What point can people or enemies, adversaries hear that, what, what's the effect? You know, effectively plugging that into the physical environment. So when you have a drone with a Typhon distraction device creates an effect, how long is that enemy incapacitated for? Do you have two seconds to then make entry? Is it like a flashbang? Do you have a couple of seconds? And you know, similarly with the combined arms, you know, the one aspect of exactly like you said, being able to bring in dislocate, geographically dislocated entities is some of the work we're doing with D3 at the moment in the UK is how often does, for instance, a a drone operator in a platoon of an infantry regiment get to speak to a pilot or get to operate with a pilot? How often do they get to actually call in an artillery, you know, speak to a foo from an artillery regiment? And actually doing that, splitting that synthetically up. So you can have the foo plug in, at, you know, somewhere where they're based, and then you have the infantry dismounted commander where they're based, iterating, well, that didn't work, let's do that again. You know, there's no cost, there's no ammunition, nature cost you know artillery obviously increasing the, the, the bigger the uh, the bigger the caliber the more expensive the uh, dollar bill sign so effectively being able to do hundreds and hundreds of iterations in synthetic and then working out how do we do it how do we speak and i think that's the really exciting thing of this sort of the, bringing drones in and then applying that synthetic sort of wrap is being able to sort of really revolutionize the frequency of training no, that's brilliant. Uh, thanks, Rob. Thanks for that. And you know, I, I recommend anybody to go and have a look at the the webinar that Rob provided, and it will go into much greater detail uh, from that training side. Um, so that takes on to you've seen all the all the speakers now. Um, um, so bar the shouting, um, do do we have any questions? So we've actually answered most of the questions as they've come through. Um, there's been quite a lot of questions, but if anybody does want to have any outstanding questions, just chuck them in the questions panel now. Um, we've got a couple of minutes um, before we'll then wrap up. No, that's good. Uh, uh, so the intent was to try and generate a discussion uh, that would cover a lots of uh, a variety of different areas. Um, and and, um, and and I've seen the the messages pop up. If you do have questions that 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 sort of come up come to you. Uh, later on, oh, I wish I'd asked that, or you want some greater detail on anything, then then please do shout, uh, and then we'll answer them to to the full ability. And and whether that's about the drone specifically, or about Forsberg or 4GD or 2IC or whatever, then then that's that's absolutely not a, not a problem at all. Well, let's. Um, I, suppose, I suppose actually, Matt, on, before we before we 
before we sort of move on, I suppose a question for me really is, hmm. where should we be now with drones and what is the next logical step? Where where are we falling short at the moment and what could we implement now to make effect? Okay. So interestingly enough, the so th this is obviously hit some some good headlines recently about the the use of these systems and bringing them in and and it, moving forward within the modern battle space. We're still behind the power curve, um, certainly compared to our adversaries. Um, I think the reality here is first of all is to get the the procurement framework in place to be able to um, to be able to make it happen. Uh, and that, that requires contracts and opportunities from there to have the discussions and engage directly with industry, but engaging with the industry at the SME level, uh, because that's where a lot of the innovation at this level is, level is occurring. So I, I think we're, we're moving rapidly forward and there's some real enthusiasts within, uh, if, if enthusiast is the right word, some, some real experts within, within uh, all services, but they tend to be at the relatively low level. Um, so getting them into the space to lead the think and help develop this uh, and have that engagement from the end user point of view. Um, you know, we've, we've seen a number of things come out which are talking about working out what it is that the statement user requirement is. Uh, I think the challenge here is the statement user requirement today could be very different to the statement user requirement next week because something else may have come onto the, the marketplace. So having an agile, and we've, there's that word again, having a, a, a mobile and, and developing and flexible framework that allows drones to develop and bring and, and snowball and bring other things into that into play, which is one of the things we wanted to try and show today, is, is going to be key to make it happen. But it is happening. It is definitely happening. Okay, one quick question has just come in. Uh, how are drones being developed for the maritime environment? Okay, so you'll have heard Sam talk about um, the uh, the weather the weather uh, elements of the uh, and after USA, uh, you know, so having that ability to be within a water environment, albeit not submersed, um, you know, it, it is improving. Um, I think with the larger drones, it's, it's relatively easier to get better um, uh, better weather protection or better environment protection. Uh, certainly the the normal standard commercial drones off the shelf are not going to be particularly happy about uh, the maritime environment in that regard. I think the, the, the other question here is to ask, what would you be using the small drones for with a relatively limited range within a maritime environment um, that, it, that, a, that a large drone is not suitable for? But uh, Sam, go on, mate, you, you, you've jumped yeah, in. Yeah, if I can just jump in quickly. So that, that's exactly right in terms of the weatherproofing. Um, the only other factor to look at is um, basically how you take off and land in a maritime environment that's a that's a that's a key factor that that can limit operations um you know out at sea so there is a system that that, that we are bringing to the market called plank uh which allows you to land uh without using gps um on a, on a moving point so that can be vehicles like trucks and cars but also uh, also boats as well and that's compact compatible with the parrot drones so we can use that to launch from a vessel and then the drone will autonomously return and land on that vessel even though the vessel has moved so that's solving one of the the, the main issues with maritime use of, of drones cool thanks sam any more just uh, yeah a couple more questions coming through um god yeah they're starting to come through quick now so uh <laughs> We're talking, uh, so there's a question about making um, physical sort of carry cases storage systems um, comes back to that on the man uh, load carriage. Is there anything in place at the moment? The guys are currently making stuff out of PVC pipes and not quite happy with the outcome. Yeah, it, it, yeah, this is a big problem. It's come back on feedback. And actually, I've just seen Asif has just joined us as well. So Asif from from Parrot. Uh, so great to have you here, Asif. Um, the uh, yeah. There are three development projects ongoing. So currently, the each of the drones comes with uh, well, the Anafi Thermal SE come with a, a sort of a soft case, um, and then the USA comes with it with a larger Peli case, which which obviously isn't that um, ergonomic for for those that are on uh, that are patrolling around. So with the, we're currently now, and we'll see the first samples arrive within within probably the next week. Um, so since the USA was first announced, 
uh, what was in summertime, then that immediately started off a, a, a development project. And actually, we had a great um, a great demonstration down in Care Went, uh, where we're a lot of, where was the first we were seeing this first seeing this feedback coming from the end user, and, and it just highlighted the importance of getting that feedback direct from the end user to the to the the developers and the, and the businesses. So, yeah, we should have something really really quick. Uh, we're looking at a completely waterproof solution, um, which looks pretty cool. Uh, that will then lead to other iterations and other opportunities to try and make it fit for all kinds of different um, uses. Okay, um, two more quick questions. What type of the capability integration tasks that we've discussed do we think might may be functional for trials within the next six months? <laughs> Honestly, question. all of them. Uh, they, they are. This is six months is an eon in uh, in in drone. I think Asif would completely agree with me. Yeah, in, in drone, drone, drone world, six months the world the, the galaxy changes, uh, and I think. The stuff you know phil's jumped on here as well the stuff that phil's working on uh, that's there you know and graham from 2ic that can get going within within as he pointed out hours and days um so this is not a long flash to bang excuse excuse yeah. the technology so the the, the hardware is there a lot of the sdk stuff that we've done with developments actually takes a very short period of time what's required is engagement from the end user you know and it's not a nice case of, of and and it's not to solutionize um, uh, a, a, the, the, the problem, but to give us what is it you want to achieve? Tell us what you want to achieve, and you may find that there is a different way. So we were talking about putting on a laser target designator as a payload onto a drone. Well, that that comes with a whole raft of different implications, whereas using the the camera imagery and the the data from the drone to solve the problem but in a different way to achieve the same effect is something that's that's you know there are so many people far more intelligent than i am significantly who work work on these systems who can solve these problems so lean on lean on that industry let them let them go and find those those solutions for you I think from, from our perspective, Matt, um, distraction is available now. Um, we've got certain integrations with, with you know, a number of the platforms that we've discussed on, on the, the forum today. Um, but the other thing is that um, as, as a payload, you know, our base systems are completely platform agnostic. So whatever the platform that's in use out there, we, we could potentially be bolted onto it. Um, you know, whether that's done by the end user or whether that's something that we would do it, it is up for discussion. But uh, so distractions available now. Um, there's going to be within the next six to eight months. The the energetic capability is is coming. Um, so you know we're as I say we're working very closely with um, with partners, um, significant partners that a lot of the the military um, participants of this webinar will will be aware of. So you know they are looking at miniaturising um, or certainly making. Um, things that can be carried on drones and released by by mechanisms that we develop. Good, and, and I think you, you, you know, Graham. I think to answer specifically the question which was talking about the integration side, and I, I'm I'm kind of assuming that that was part of where we're going at. I mean, I think this is, you know, lockdown with with standing. Uh, actually, as soon as we're free to 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 move, it, it, those discussions can start straight away. Uh, and to start to integrate these 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 elements uh, as far as a usable solution. Yeah, absolutely, and a lot of what I talked about, we've got large elements of that that we've been doing or done anyway for. Um, obviously, given the nature of where we're doing something, I can't talk that openly about it, but privately I could certainly talk about some of the things we've been doing. Certainly some of the work we've been doing in the US, even in COVID times, from a standing start in about five months, we've integrated onto some of their platforms that you would think would take years to integrate into or onto we've applied our software to to some of some of their platforms there in that time and we've done it remotely during covid so this stuff's here and now this isn't you know a lot of this integration interoperability it sounds like it's really hard because it has been really hard but that's what we do and we yeah mm. we can do this stuff quite quickly and we have a lot of it already done as well such as yeah. atac and we're doing doing a lot with atac wintac various other things like that we um, we have a lot of that already yeah, and I think you made the point before that it's not uh, it's not unique to those elements. We know that they're being used a lot by by the guys on the ground. Um, so, you know, yes, of course, th those are opportunities to work alongside that. But there's also, you know, 
do your worst essentially bring bring the systems in old new and 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 whatever and 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 you will you will find the solution and it's exactly the same you start small you do a couple of things you join a few things that will give you value you then trial that and see how that value helps how that changes how you might want to do things and that will then do the next iteration and the next iteration which ties in very much with rob's point about try some of it in a simulated environment try some of it in real and blend between the two and just iterate and, and build up but in six months you can do a lot in six months if you just get on with it um, and I'll, I'll just bring Asif here and talk about some of the integration projects that we've seen done with Para. Um, and there's a, a great guy called Jerome, and I know Rob's done some work with him and everything like that. So, so it's a very proactive environment amongst these, and very collaborative actually, dare I say it, with, within these organizations. And actually looking across the top of the screen here, you've got a perfect uh, kind of cross section through those kind of organizations, where it, from logistics to uh, software to hardware. Uh, and and the 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 will to develop is there, so hence the speed is so quick. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And, and as parrots, you know, we work. Yeah, you know, we we know everybody on the on the panel here as well. You mentioned Jerome, my colleague, and he's a director of partnerships uh, and software development kits as well. So between us as parrot, we're a French company, so we're not too far away. We can get some very quick answers as well, uh, and that's quite key. Because we know that people need to know quickly is something possible, and then how how long will it take to develop? Yeah, absolutely. No, good question. Thank you very much for that one, Justin. What's next? Uh, well, basically, I'll say at this point, look, keep your questions coming in. There's a lot of them still floating around. We will answer everything. So, uh, so send us in. There's some details at the end, um, email addresses, etc., to uh, to get in contact with us and with Copters as well. So we will answer everything. I suppose the last one that comes through um, that we'll have time for now is uh, when looking at on-demand the solutions and the amazing deployability of this latest technology, what are the power considerations that have been given to ensure that technology remains versatile and valid for the duration of a mission? Okay, so that hits two key areas. One uh, is the, the power inherent within the drones themselves, and two is your power solution that you're carrying on the person. If we go back uh, to the amount of batteries I used to carry, whether they were double A's, triple A's, lithiums, for a variety of different radios, uh, for um, FC, you know, fire controlling devices, all this kind of stuff, I think the the element there is is we would advise, and they are now the, the technology does exist to be able to carry one reservoir of power, which will then allow the the, the power to be maintained within your drones, and that you can constantly charge what you're doing. Um, that's a different webinar to go into altogether. All but from the point of view of the drones, two things that we've seen. First of all, we've seen a um, the drones themselves, if they're power drones, uh, come with uh, three batteries in the, in, the, in the pack. I think I'm right in saying, Asif, off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, and, and what we're seeing is we've, in, we've increased the defense packages to have more batteries in to other elements in that, that reflect the feedback from the end user. And, and they're sort of balancing for guys going on patrol carrying five batteries and the batteries are intelligent batteries uh, and you know they 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 recharge quite quite quickly uh, certainly for what they are um, and and they 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 can be managed in the more traditional sense what does the future look like the future looks like the ability for someone to have this the power management within on themselves um, and and uh, and there's a few companies out there now that are producing some really amazing solutions which would be able to charge all the different devices whether that's using solar whether it's taking power from other uh, sources uh, and then bringing it on um so there's some good stuff out there some really really good stuff out there but yeah power is is been something that came back in the feedback i think um from a from a payload perspective as well matt i mean there's always going to be a trade off between you know the weight the additional weight that you're carrying on the platform and and how that affects potentially the the flight time and the power requirement um from a from the actual individual payload perspective um everything is optimized so that we are drawing the minimum amount of power and uh, you know in the to use the distraction device as an example you only hit the peak power when you actually initiate the device so it sits there dormant um not drawing power from the from the battery um on the drone until you actually need to initiate it but um in the, in the case of a couple of integrations that we've done we we just draw the power directly from the drone either via a payload connector or directly from the the smart battery itself right 
Cool. Well, thank thank for those questions. And 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 obviously, as Justin says, there's more questions going to come in. We will answer them all, um, but they're they're really useful. Uh, and do feel free to get in touch with us. Um, you know, actually talking about defence package, really, you know, perfectly segues into talk uh, to 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 pass over to Steve and talk about copters. Um, Steve, you've got a slide in front of you that talks around the, the the areas that you cover as that sort of the distributor, the logistical, and the supporting element. Do you want to just take it? Take us through it quickly. Yeah, well, thanks everybody as well, and, and great, um, great host in there, Matt, as well. It's been really interesting for me uh, as well as anybody else. Uh, one thing I, I would draw it back to is you know, we we enable organisations. That organisation may be a police force, it may be a civil engineering company, it may be a battalion uh, within the MOD. Now, the single reason in the past people fail is because they buy something off the shelf and that's it and then they try and put in a strategy to to get the best out of it and and in invariably that would they would not achieve that because there's not an ecosystem around them to to enable that strategy uh, to be achieved so that so it, it, it's it's the drone but it's also the payloads and we've talked about you know thermal imaging multi-spectral the uh, distraction devices there's the software there's planning software that's that, that's involved, so you can autonomously put that drone on a on a mission um, to potentially recce or survey or whatever, and also the 3D mapping type software. Support is so important. You know, you need you need on the, you need local UK support for everything, so that the, that whole ecosystem is supported going forward. And, and training and you know we've talked about you know, there's, there's the practical training on the drone there's, but there's also everything else that goes around it you know, we talked about the synthetic training uh you know amazing what uh, you know in the future vr and things like that are going to do for for being able to uh to practice uh, using the drone so you can use a drone a thousand times before you use it once and that one time you really have to use it you you you, you execute perfectly and i think what you know for us, it's creating that perfect ecosystem of best in world of all those elements so that the strategy when put in place works and it works perfectly. Um, and obviously that's you know, one of the reasons, and many reasons that, that we're all working together because that it, we, you know, we have identified out each other as, as the best in the world solution to be able to, to achieve this in this, in this space. Um, but yeah, that hopefully that, that just, gets over the, the philosophy that we're coming at here and you know, bringing all these elements together which are which are interrelated interdependent and and together you know get get the right solution in a i'll use matt's expression an agile fashion because this is an agile technology and technology that's changing fast and, and it, you you cannot do it by just buying something off the shelf from one to one point of supply it needs all the other elements bringing together uh, so yeah th thank you cheers steve well uh so we'll, we'll finish there so first of all i'd like say uh thank you to 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 all the contributors um you know it's 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 we've, we've tried something different with the webinar try to have a bit of a debate try to keep it lively or god forbid you'd have to listen to my voice all the time um so 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 thank you for everybody that's put the effort in uh, thank you to all of you that, that signed up to the webinar and 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 thank you for your attention it, it is really really appreciated and and the comments and the feedback are critical to to how we do business and and you are absolutely uh, the most important part of this process here uh, so please reach out if you've got any questions we're, we're very very happy to, to answer questions and, and help in any way that we can um, I'll finish on the fact that so we will be sending out a pack with all the information, all the contact details for everybody that's been involved uh, will be made available to you. you. You are more than welcome to get in touch with us as at Brigantes or at Copters, uh, but but there's no requisite. If you want to go and have a conversation and you feel more comfortable doing and having a chat with with Graham on the two IC stuff, then please do. Um, you know, it's it's a very very much cooperative space here. So thank you again. Um, have a, uh, a a good rest of the week and uh, please stay well.